Uh, let me to invite you at the first discussion panel today. Discussion panel B1 in the nice, very nice area of Stala. Regards to Jelina, to our colleagues from Jelina. Ahoj, Marian. Do you hear Ahoj. me? Počujeme Ahoj. Ahoj. Ahoj, počujeme sa. Ahoj, počujem ťa. Dobré ráno, želám do Žiliny, pozdravujeme. V peknej, v prekrásnej sály uh, Myšlivskej. Dúfam, že ju aj trošku vidíte, lebo je veľmi krásna. Tento priestor je veľmi krásny, kde budeme sa dnes, kde budeme dnes prezentovať. Uh, so, uh, there are in this discussion panel, there are uh, nine uh, lectures. Only two uh, will be presented uh, directly here and fixed on in online form. So now I would like to ask Marian Handrik um, about uh, your first lecture analysis of stress concentration on wealth sur surface. Please. Takže vážená pani predsedkynia, vážené dámy, vážení páni, dovolte mi, aby som vám stručne poznámil s tým, ako sme riešili problematiku analýzy stavu napätosti po zvare. Takže reálny tvár zvaru ovplyvňuje veľké množstvo parametrov, je to napríklad typ zvaru technológia zvárania, parametre zvárania, teda aký napríklad prúd, napätie sa používa, rýchlosť pohybu pri zváraní a podobne. Tieto parametre všetky ovplyvňujú výsledný tvar zvaru na povrchu, ako aj štruktúru zvaru vo vnútri, či tam sú nejaké technologické chyby, nejaké dutiny a podobne. Tie vnútorné poruchy, tie sme my, my sme sa mi nezaoberali, na skôr je vplyv toho povrchu na stav napätosti na povrchu zvaru. Takže máme niekoľko možností, ako pripraviť ten povr model toho povrchu zvaru. Môžeme ho vytvoriť s ideálnou geometriou, čiže namodelujeme ten tvar toho zvaru tak, ako si ho predstavujeme. Môžeme ten tvar zvaru urobiť s nejakou vopred definovanou geometriou, čiže môžeme si určiť nejaké geometrické tvary na povrchu, ktoré nám budú charakterizovať ktoré nám budú charakterizovať ten povrch. Môžeme urobiť nejaký generátor náhodných tvarov, ktorí budú na povrchu, čiže budeme na základe nejakých štatistických údajov generovať povrch zvaru. Môžeme prípadne použiť nejaké výpočtové metódy, bolo publikovaných viacero článkov, kde riešili problematiku tuhnutia materiálu vo zvare. Tam sa pritom dal vypočítať aj tvar, vlastne bolo to vplyvňované tými elektromagnetickými poliami, ktoré sú vo zvare. Toto sa hlavne využívalo pri zváraní elektrickým prúdom. My sme sa však zamerali vo zvároch pre technológie zamerané na vysokoenergetické technológie, teda laser a elektronový lúč. Ten zvár konkrétny, ktorý sme my robili, bol zváraný laserom. Posledná možnosť toho, ako sa dá riešiť ten povrch, je taký, že Poprosím vás, aby ste neskúšali prezentácie, pretože ma prerušujete. Čiže s reálnym tvarom toho zvaru, ktorý získame 3D skenovaním. Tu je ukážka toho zvaru, ktorý sme riešili. Urobili sme 3D sken zvarovanej ploche, plochy povrchu, Následnú analýzu sme chceli robiť v systéme ADINA. 
Systém Adina umožňuje import telies vo formáte STL, čo je štandardným výstupom zo skenovania. Problém je v tom, že teleso nemôžeme modifikovať, čiže nemôžeme ho žiadnym spôsobom upravovať. Dokonca to teleso nemôžeme ani transformovať, čiže ho niekam posunúť, otočiť a podobne, ak nie je napríklad v základných rovinách súradného systému. Okraje podmienky je možné zadávať iba na elementy, čo je dosť problematické. A ten model, keď sme ho načítali, tak mal okolo 1 milióna bodov a okolo 160 tisíc plôch na povrchu telesa. Ten model po importe vyzeral takto. Môžeme si všimnúť, že na okraji tej naskenovanej súčiastky je obrovské množstvo tých bodov a ploch, ktoré v podstate nám robia problematickú následnú analýzu. Vidíme, že ten model ani nie je otočený v zmysle nejakých súradných osí, takže by bolo problematické zadávanie aj okrajových podmienok. Tak sme sa sústredili na to, ako môžeme tento model upraviť. Pomohli sme si s programom MATLAB, kde sme naimportovali ten súbor STL. Súbor STL má svoju štruktúru takú, že sú v ňom uvedené každá jedna plôžka na povrchu, sú to trojuholníky ako skupina troch bodov so súrodnicami, k tomu je ešte prípadne uvedená normála tejto plochy. Takže po importe do MATLABu sme vygenerovali súbor pre ADINu, kde boli tieto plochy trojuholníkov vytvorené. Potom sme naimportovali do ADINy takto vytvorený súbor. On už nebol vo formáte STL, ale bol v tom prirodzenom formáte parasolídu ktorý v ADINI vieme bez problémov modifikovať, takže sme z toho vytvorili jedno teleso. Následne sme to teleso orezali. V matlabe sme potom extrahovali hornu a orezali sme ho, ešte otočili. Potom sme si extrahovali hornu a dolnú plochu toho telesa. Táto extrakcia tej hornej dolnej plochy bolo potrebná kvôli tomu, že pri tom orezávaní nám tam vznikali veľmi maličké hrany tých plôch a body veľmi blízko seba, čo nám následne robilo problémy s sieťovaním a podobne. Takže opätovne sme načítali tú hornú a dolnú plochu, ale už iba body do tej adiny, kde jednoducho myškou sme si vyklikali po okraji, ktoré body chceme zmazať. No a zase tieto body sme si načítali do adiny a vygenerovali opäť nový súbor pre ADINu, ktorý nám vytvorí teleso v tom module ADINA M. Po ukončení tejto procedúry sme získali model, ktorý mal 6600 bodov a okolo 12 000 plôch na povrchu, čím sa výrazne zredukoval ten model. Tu je ukážka toho telesa, ktorý sme vlastne orezávali, čiže vybrali sme si iba tú vnútornú časť toho naskenovaného modelu. Tu je ukážka hornej a spodnej strany toho zvaru. Poprosím, aby ste ma neprerušovali v prezentácii. Takže tu je horná a dolná plocha toho zváraného súčiastky. Následne sme vytvorili konečnoprvkový model. Použili sme lineárny elastický materiálny model s materiálnymi vlastnosťami pre ocel. Chceli sme vlastne určiť, aká bude hodnota koncentrácie napätí v mieste toho zvaru, tak sme zaťažili konštrukciu zaťažením 1 MPa. Použili sme lineárne tetrahedronálne elementy veľkosti 0,3 mm. V tomto obrázku je vidno, aká Haló, Marian? Nepočujeme ťa? Marian?
Aha. Takže vypadlo. Vyp... Some problems with, with technique. Problém s pro, problém, tak, takže pro, problém, pro, problém s, tak vážení kolegovia, problém s pripojením, čo sa môže stať, technika zrádza. So, uh, we will follow with uh, the next... Uh, Počujete ma? Uh, ...which is entitled in analysis of the belt touching process. Počujeme, Počujeme sa? sa? Počujeme sa, lebo vypadol si nám. Áno. Vy... Okay, tak môžeme pokračovať, áno? Áno, áno môžeme pokračovať. Možno, že ten výpadok nastal s tým, že niektorí ľudia sa skúšajú pripájať počas prezentácie, skúšajú si prezentáciu načítať a možno, že oni spôsobili tým, že sa prihlasí, že budú ako oni prezentovať. Takže ospravedlňujem sa možno, že chyba na mojej strane technická. E, takže tu vidíme hustotu siete. E, hustota siete v oblasti zvaru je dostatočne hustá na to, aby sme mohli potom považovať výsledky za dostatočne presné. E, tu už je vidno priebeh normálových napätí v mieste zvaru. V nasledujúcom obrázku sme vytipovali niekoľko miest označených číslami 1 až 6 zľava doprava, kde sú vyhodnotené potom hodnoty napätí a určená hodnota koncentrácie napätí. Takže na tejto tabulke je v prvom stĺpci teda tá pozícia toho bodu, kde sa nachádzal, v druhom je uvedené, o koľko sa zmenšila hrúbka Tej, alebo okolko došlo k poklesu toho povrchu zvaru voči tej rovine tých zváraných materiálov. No a v ďalších dôsledcoch vidíme hodnotu koncentrácie napätia v smere zaťaženia. No a v poslednom stĺpci sú redukované formy ses napätia. E, môžeme si teda v tej tabulke všimnúť, že aj malá zmena e, hrúbky materiálu okolo 5 až 6 spôsobuje koncentrácie napätí okolo 1,5 až 1,6. Pri zmene hrúbky materiálu okolo 8 čo bolo v bode 5, dochádza takmer k dvojnásobnej hodnote koncentrácie napätí v mieste zvaru. No a pri zhruba 13 poklese toho povrchu zvaru došlo k 2,5 násobnej hodnote prekročenia tej hodnoty napätí voči nominálnemu napätiu 1 MPa. Takže vidíme, že aj relatívne malá zmena povrchu toho zvaru, teda pokles o 8 môže spôsobiť dvojnásobnú koncentráciu napätí čo môže byť dôležité pri dimenzovaní, nielen pri dimenzovaní na statickú pevnosť, ale hlavne pri dimenzovaní na únavu zvarov, kde dochádza k výraznému poklesu tých napätí, ale teda nie poklesu, ale zvýšeniu napätí, čo môže mať výrazný vplyv na životnosť materiálu. Ešte by som chcel upozorniť na jednu, jeden detail, neviem, či to tu bude vidno, je to tu trošku vidno. V tej pravej dolnej časti tej, toho obrázku je vidno ten charakteristický priebeh na tej bočnej strane napätí, ktoré je charakteristicky pre existujúcu trhlinu alebo vznikajúcu trhlinu alebo na čele trhliny. Dobre, ďakujem za pozornosť. Ďakujem veľmi pekne za zaujímavú prezentáciu. Thank you very much. Uh, sú nejaké otázky? Any question, please? Ja by som sa spýtala, Marian, uh, 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 
ako, ako ste vlastne získavali vstupné parametre vlastne do tohto uh, modelu? My sme, nám v podstate ani nezáleží, keďže my sme robili statickú analýzu, tak nám, alebo takto, my sme robili, to je nejaká prvotná analýza, ktorú sme robili, my, pre nás nebolo dôležité, aké boli to technologické parametre zvárania, pre nás bol dôležitý v tomto okamihu ten tvár. My sme sa zatiaľ nesústredovali, že ako sa tie technické parametre zvárania majú vplyv na ten tvar z váru v tomto okamihu skôr išlo pre nás vytvoriť metodiku toho, akým spôsobom analyzovať ten stav napätosti v tom zváre. No a ten povrch zváru, alebo ten tvar naskenovaný sú čiastky, ten sme získali 3D skenovaním, tento povrch, ten sme získali 3D skenovaním pomocou laseru. Ďakujem veľmi pekne ešte raz. Pozdravujem do Žiliny aj ostatných kolegov. Želám pekný deň. No, ostatní kolegovia sú v práci, ja som momentálne chorý, takže som z domu. Tak ešte o to viac pozdravujeme a želáme škore vyzdravenie. Dúfam, že to nie je Nie, nie. na chladnutie, takže, takže teším sa, že sa uvidíme čoskoro pri nejakej príležitosti. Pekný deň. Aj vám. Dovidenia. So, we will follow uh, with next uh, presentation or lecture analysis of the belt patching process with using a single cutting edge. I, I would like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Vo Dominik Wojtkowiak for your presentation. Uh, my name is Dominik Wojtkowiak and I'm representing the Poznan University of Technology, the Institute of Motion Design. And today I'm going to present you the uh, analysis of the belt punching process with using a single cutting edge. Uh, <coughs> next. Okay. Uh, the object of research are the multi-layer polymer com composite belts, which can be divided into three main groups. Uh, <coughs> we can distinguish the plastic light belts, uh, which are mostly made of the um, polyurethane, uh, uh, reinforced with some fabrics. Uh, the next group is the rigid belts with the increased strength, uh, which uh, core is made of the polyamide. And the last group are the durable uh, and flexible belts, which are reinforced with the Kevlar uh, fibers. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, from these materials, we can manufacture the perforated belts, uh, which are the uh, conveyor belts with a pattern of holes, and they are mostly used for a vacuuming purpose. Uh, vacuuming transport purposes. Like. Uh, the belt perforation can be made with either a single cutting edge or uh, two cutting edges. Uh, in this case, uh, we have analyzed the single cutting edge process, uh, which can be made with using a, a hollow piercing punch with the cutting edge towards inside or outside, uh, and a reducer plate. Really? Uh, the research uh, was performed on the strength testing machine uh, with using a um, set of uh, tools with a binary geometry. Uh, so we have used uh, uh, five uh, different uh, punches with the, uh, with the cutting edge toward inside with a diameter of 10 and three different angles of blade, 20, 30 and 40 degrees, uh, and to three additional uh, punches with diameters of uh, 8, 6, and 5 millimeters. Uh, in case of the uh, punching, uh, piercing punches with the cutting edge toward outside, we have used only the diameter 10 millimeters and 3 angles, uh, 20, 30, and 40 degrees. The material was cut into the specimens, with, uh, which, was, uh, which had dimensions 30 uh, times uh, 150 millimeters. And on each uh, specimen, five holes was made with the spacing of 20 millimeters. Uh, we have uh, used the material, the belt uh, uh, TFL-10S, uh, which is uh, 
the representative of the second group, so it has a core made of the polyamide, uh, it has two protective gaskets uh, which was made of uh, uh, polyamide fabrics and uh, two, uh, two uh, layers which are made of the nitrobutyl rubber. Next. Uh, we have also used the finite element method model, uh, which was made in the ABACUS program. Uh, since using the classical finite element method uh, with, uh, <coughs> provided some problems, which was connected with the element distortion and uh, too early uh, abortion of the analysis, we have used the couplet uh, Eulerian and Lagrangian method. So in this case, uh, we have uh, part of the belt which represents the uh, real, real thickness, which is the Lagrangian part, Lagrangian part, and we have uh, the element which is slightly greater, which represents the oil element. And the punch is modeled as a rigid body which uh, penetrates through the oil element parts, which uh, take the uh, material properties from the Lagrangian. Lagrangian. Uh, the material properties was uh, selected from the previous uh, research, uh, so we have defined the material which is in reality the orthotropic uh, belt, the, the orthotropic material. We defined it as an isotropic one to uh, decrease the computational time of the analysis. Uh, however, uh, we have also used some uh, adjustment of the model in order to uh, represent the real, uh, real values which should be obtained during the simulation. Uh, and I will uh, explain it later during the validation of the, uh, of the results. Next, please. Uh, first, I would like to present to you the experimental results, uh, which uh, in case of the uh, uh, O-punches, we can see the uh, clear uh, trend that uh, with uh, decreasing, with decreasing the blade angle, we uh, have uh, greatly reduced, we can break, greatly reduce the perforation force. Uh, in case of the uh, PI punch, uh, we can see that the correlation is not uh, not so clear as visible. However, uh, this is caused by a technological uh, error, which is obtained during the uh, imprecision of machine. However, the main uh, important uh, conclusion is that uh, by decreasing the angle of play, we can uh, reduce the, um, the perforation force and we will be using it later during the optimization uh, process. Uh, we have also analyzed different uh, diameters of the piercing punches and we can clearly see that uh, if we decrease the diameter, we can also reduce the force. Uh, however, the, the um, for the further dec uh, decreasement of the diameter uh, below 5 millimeters, uh, the further reduction is uh, very uh, hardly visible. Uh, and in the table 2, we can see the summary of the uh, perforation force for different uh, geometry of the, uh, of the punches. Uh, then we have, uh, we have conducted a series of uh, FEM analyses. And uh, here are two representatives of uh, analysis for each, each type of the tool. Uh, as we can see, uh, there is some, some offset uh, between the experimental and FEM results. And this offset is caused by uh, additional uh, deformation of the reducer's plate. In the FEM analysis, in order to decrease the computational time, we have uh, uh, skip to the uh, reducer plate. However, in order to adjust the results, uh, the offset was uh, calculated and then uh, used in uh, all uh, characteristics. So that's why the offset occurs. Uh, and as you can see, uh, since we have used the isotropic approach to model the uh, orthotropic part, uh, the characteristic uh, slightly differs. Uh, however, the most important for us was the maximum perforation force, which occurs at uh, punch displacement of 2.65, which is the thickness of the belt. And we can see that, uh, in this case, uh, the precision of uh, our analysis is, uh, is enough to, uh, 
then to evaluate this uh, type of uh, tools. Uh, as I was talking about the uh, uh, simplification, uh, simplifications, uh, we have skipped the the polyamide producer plate. Uh, so in this case, we have to calculate uh, what uh, real uh, what real deformation of the reducer plate itself is. So uh, at first, we have uh, made uh, the test with using the reducer plate between the belt and the steel base. And after that, we have conducted the same research, but without the reducer plate. And by using the divergence between the both characteristics, uh, we have determined the, the correlation between the pump displacement and the compressive force. Uh, as we can see, uh, in the first uh, range, the linear elastic uh, correlation occurs. However, after uh, exceeding the value of one millimeter, the material almost uh, became a rigid body, so that's why we have, uh, based on this characteristic in the first range, we have uh, calculated uh, what balance, what uh, deformation of the reducer plate has to be used. Uh, of course, this test was made for the cylindrical punch with diameter 10 millimeters, and if we had a hollow punch, the compression area differs. So that's why the compression area was uh, determined using the presented, uh, presented formula. Uh, of course, for the uh, outer and uh, inner uh, direction of the plate, uh, the sign will be different in the, the formula. Uh, so, uh, in the case of the uh, punches with the cutting edge toward our side, uh, we also need to use some multiplication factor. Uh, which is connected with different uh, properties, mechanical properties in the compressive and uh, tensile uh, tests. Uh, the, the ratio of compressive and tensile strain uh, equals 4.46, and of course, this is made for the uh, uh, least, uh, least sharp uh, tool, so that's why uh, we have determined the characteristic which uh, helps to uh, adjust the results to obtain uh, proper solutions. Uh, additionally, in order to prevent uh, too early uh, element deletion, deletion, the displacement of failure parameter was also modeled with using the following uh, characteristic. Uh, if we uh, take a look into the uh, FEM analysis result, we can see that using the cell, uh, cell final planet method, uh, the behavior of the material looks uh, very similar to the uh, real behavior, which proves that this method is uh, appropriate for such uh, analysis. Uh, if we take a look into the uh, characteristics uh, which present the maximum perforation force uh, and the compressive stress, which are two main parameters which uh, was taken into account during the optimization process, we can see that with increasing the angle of blade, uh, we, can, we have a linear or non-linear correlation depending on the type of the tool. Uh, and in case of the compressive stress, which was calculated based on the force and the uh, area uh, of compression, which was determined analytically, uh, we can see the decreasing uh, value of stress uh, with increasing the uh, angle of the blade. However, we can see that the compression, compressive stress is not too high. Uh, so for the high, uh, high speed uh, steel, it's basically uh, all of these uh, values are basically available. However, uh, we can also take into consideration the pulsating load, which means that uh, the real uh, strength of the tool will be much more uh, much lower. Uh, in order to uh, compare these two, uh, these two criteria, uh, we have the, uh, determined the indicators, which was specified in relative to the minimum uh, perforation force and maximum uh, stress. It means that uh, we can now uh, tell uh, how does the geometry of the tool affects uh, the force or the, or the stress. Uh, so 
how many percent it will increase or decrease these values. And the optimization function itself is the multipli uh, multiplication of both indicators, and uh, we can uh, see in the, uh, in the chart that uh, we uh, have gained the second degree uh, curve, so the par parabolic curve, and uh, by finding the minimum value of this curve, we can find the effective geometry which provides the best combination of the perforation force and the compressive stress. And in this case, we have the value of 27 uh, and 27.5 uh, degree, so this is the effective angle of the plate. Uh, and uh, for the um, punches with the cutting edge toward inside, uh, also the height uh, of the cutting edge uh, has an influence uh, on the perforation force. So we have uh, conducted the test for the effective angle of plate and various height of the plate, which was uh, taken from the range uh, from 0.5 mm to the thickness of the belt, so 2.65. And based on the result, we can see that the, per, uh, the perforation force uh, can be decreased by decreasing the height. However, uh, in this case, uh, the, uh, the reduction is very small uh, compared to the total value of the force. Uh, but the compressive stress will be decisive in this case, uh, since we can see that it can be lowered uh, even five times. So based on these results, uh, we, can, uh, we concluded that uh, we need to uh, always um, choose the height of the blade, which is the closest value to the height, to the thickness of the belt. So, uh, to sum up, the whole piercing punches with cutting air towards uh, outside is more advantageous because the value of the force uh, is much lower than for the second type of the tool. Uh, regardless uh, on the type of the punch, we have a positive correlation between the angle of the, the blade and the height and the perforation force in both simulation and experimental uh, tests. And by selecting the proper tool, we can decrease the force even up to 50%, which is uh, very uh, important during the design of the machine, uh, during design process of the machines uh, for such process. The effective blades uh, angle are 27 and a half for PI punch and 27 for PO punch. And in case of the PI punch, we also need to consider the height of the plate, which should be up to the thickness of the belt. And the last, uh, last conclusion is that we applied methods of the Copeland Euler and the method is suitable method since it uh, was to get the results uh, close to the experiment. Thank you very much for your presentation. Any questions, please? Please don't forget. Yes. Could you explain the very important for this camera, this assumption in your work? We all good now, the material, construction of material made from gummy, polymer, elastomer, depends strongly, non from very important uh, detail, detail, stress. Chain stress, temperature, frequency, 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 and the, the main parameter, mechanical and neurological. You can strongly, nominally, from this detail. And I would like to know which detail did you lose in your work, in your model? Uh, of course, uh, this type of material has a strong uh, rheological uh, connection, so we have uh, 
free from the material. So it means that if we apply the load uh, during the time, uh, it will the load will decrease. Uh, or if we uh, so in such case, uh, the stroke, the load time is necessary for this phenomenon uh, to occur. And in the case of the punching of the uh, belt, the process is uh, very uh, very short, and the stress, uh, so the the, radio, uh, the creep of the material is negligible uh, in case of the um, such process because uh, of the dynamic of the pro uh, because the process is very short and the uh, um, the radio, the radiological part uh, won't be able to change the characteristic in such short uh, term of time. Uh, so uh, that's why we have used the simplification that uh, this part of the, uh, of the, of the modeling was uh, negligible. Uh, however, if we consider, uh, for example, using such type of belts in the uh, real conditions, so if they work in some vacuum conveyor, of course it should be taken into account that uh, it will take, that it will change the uh, properties of the machine. Uh, we have time for a uh, follow up question. No, no questions. Okay. So, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Presentation. My question in type of uh, uh, flexible mechanism based vibration isolator for machine tool application. I would like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Sat and now we have to like pronounce. Uh, your name. Uh, good morning, Mr. Sakuta. Good morning, madam. Good morning. Good morning. Do you hear, good morning. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, madam. Yes. So I would I would like to ask you for your presentation, please. Yes, sir. Yes, madam. I will start the presentation. Okay. So the topic of uh, the research paper is a flexible mechanism based vibration isolator for application in a machine tool. Uh, so basic nomenclature has been explained here. So uh, we are basically investigating the a novel mechanism uh, which is used for damping that is for reduction of the force transmissibility in a machine tool. So during, uh, during cutting of the metal basically uh, there is some force which is generated and uh, we are interested basically to uh, reduce the force which is transmitted during the cutting motion and uh, so so this is the nominal where m is the mass uh, then f is the frequency um, so I am I'm, I'm, I'm having a doubt whether that I am audible or not, but uh, still I will continue. Yes, madam. Ah, now I am audible. Yes, yes. But I will continue. We are hearing you. Ah, so novel feature of this mechanism yes. is that we have. Uh, sorry, madam. I I just uh, I just got some confusion. Uh, so novel feature of this particular mechanism is that we are using a flexible or compliant mechanisms, which are having some distinct advantages with respect to conventional mechanisms, which are having turning pair with respect to the toolings. Now uh, here, uh, basically, what we have seen is a basic demonstration. So there is a vibrating mass. This vibrating mass is uh, undergoing harmonic force of f naught into sine of omega t. And this is a conventional arrangement wherein we are investigating to reduce the force transmissibility. Now, so we can see here that mass is supported with an elastic element, petty element, which is having a damping coefficient. 
coefficient of C cases wherein the value of damping coefficient C is equal to 200, which corresponds to damping factor of uh, 0 0.01, which corresponds to uh, damping factor of 0 0.01. Okay. And secondly, uh, we have taken another damper, which is uh, having damping factor of 0 0.4. Now, what can be seen here is that the damping, uh, the force transmissibility is basically going to reduce when the force, uh, when the damping coefficient is being increased. Now, this is uh, basically for a conventional system. Now, next we uh, basically discuss the design of a typical passive damping system. Now, uh, uh, it can be seen that a, for a, a typical damping system, where, when we are targeting force transmissibility, then force transmissibility is maximum at resonance, thereon it goes on reducing and the force transmissibility is basically going to reduce beyond the point which corresponds to under root 2 which is equal to approximately 1.4 designed in such a manner that the operating frequency is much higher than the natural frequency. So, if you can see it here that natural frequency Fn is this and operating frequency is here. So, operating frequency is much larger higher than uh, root 2 and it is kept deliberately much higher than root 2. Now, it can be seen here that the natural frequency oscillators are designed which is beyond frequency rating is the critical frequency. Try to apply this particular system to any here natural frequency that it is not applicable. Now, it can be seen that when we see this particular system when we want to apply this particular system for a design in a machine tool, then it can be noted that for, an, uh, for a machine and dominant dominant forcing frequencies are coming in between 550 to 630 years. So, several frequency operating frequency and you can see here that operating frequency is in between 550 to 630. So, we have to keep the natural frequency very less which can be close to 200 hertz. But when we keep natural frequency equal to 200 hertz, now natural frequency Fn is equal to 1 upon 2 pi into under root k by m. So, it requires basically very low stiffness and when stiffness is kept low, then definitely the boring tool will undergo large amount of machining operation because it will uh, give rise to the inferior finish as well as non, uh, non uh, it will not be okay from machining point of view. And therefore, here we are targeting on the applications wherein we can use this system wherever high natural frequency of the isolator is desired because typically a passive damping system is not having high natural frequency. The isolator is totally dedicated to those applications wherein high natural frequency which means that it means very very brief literature review now in the first uh, literature uh, the authors have included uh, or studied contact stiffness and contact damping at the uh, interface of a tool holder and damping is basically taken as energy dissipation so it is in between two rubbing parts metal parts so it is taken as a uh, coulomb friction damping uh, they have investigated and they have uh, seen that whenever damping is there, the performance of the cutting uh, um, uh, cutting operation improves. In the second case, the damping element has been included in the boring uh, tool holder in the form of elastically deformable mass and uh, the stiffness has been controlled. Now, this damping element also has given a better performance. In the next case, Mohan Natarajan have basically used a controllable damper and they have reported that when a controllable damper is turned on, the surface roughness is improving. So, better machining uh, quality can be obtained when the damper is turned on. And this is a controllable damper which is MR damper. In the next case, a centrifugal damper has been proposed and this centrifugal damper means there are basically 8 slots which are in circumferential direction and in these 8 slots, damping material has been inserted and authors have reported approximately 53% of increase in the depth of cut than that of the operation without damper. In the last case uh, here, uh, a milling operation has been targeted and what the authors have done is that they have kept a vibration isolator below the machining table on which the component is being machined. Now here experimentally, 
uh, they have observed and how uh, they have observed basically that uh, incorporation of this passive vibration damper is giving rise to improved or the, you can we can uh, finish the part with higher cutting speed so productivity is improving so it can be noted here that the productivity is improving but at the same time here we have to also investigate basically that when a vibration absorber is being implemented what is the force transmissibility and what is the deflection of the cutting tool and this deflection of the cutting tool has to be very less and it has to be compared with that of the deflection which is achieved without using a vibration isolator now this is a the typical vibration isolator which has been designed for boring operation now you can see here that this vibration absorber isolator is in the form of there are some rigid links which are connected together by flexible elements now dimensions of the flexible element has been given in score now we are targeting here a vertical direction and as per this vertical direction we are targeting certain natural frequency now here the dimensions of this uh, mechanism which is uh, a flexible mechanism based vibration isolator these are selected so that it can be used in machine tools first of all and the dimensions are selected to get the desired spectral response also you can see here one elastomer has been added in between here and this elastomer is a damping element now the novel feature of this design is that there are uh, the novel feature of this design is, is that there are flexible links here and there is a elastomer and direction of damping of this elastomer or direction of action of this elastomer is not vertical but horizontal now the vibrations which are going to come on the boring tool are vertical but the vibrations are but the direction in which the elastomer is operated is for in horizontal direction these are this is the novelty of this vibration isolator now this vibration isolator is having rigid links and the rigid links are connected by flexible joints and elastomer has been used for energy dissipation now the design criteria here the design criteria is such that we are we are targeting here a boring operation wherein the boring operation is having nice resonance frequency in between 800 to 850 hertz and dominant frequencies are in between the range which is given 590 to 700 now accordingly we are selecting the parameters and our parameters are such that we are meeting the criteria which are required for a typical boring operation the dimensions are seen here the overall dimensions are seen 50 by 100 by 12 flexible uh, link length is 3.2 mm flexible link thickness is 5.5 mm the material of this thing is post steel <laughs> now the uh, analysis has been uh, carried out here and this analysis has been done by two perspectives so first is prdm method which is pseudo rigid body method and second is finite element analysis method now prdm method is slightly inferior in comparison to fea when it comes to accuracy and therefore we are using here two methods and therefore we are using here these two methods now prbm method is basically better because uh, the computationally this method uh, this method is more fast and uh, uh, basically the computation can be done very quickly than the, that of the fbm method now we are selecting the configuration such that natural frequency close to 1000 hertz is obtained and this natural frequency is much higher than that of the natural frequency of the machine during the cutting operation now we have seen we are watching here uh, basically the force transmissibility now we have verified this with uh, prbm method as well as finite element analysis method and we are noting that the force transmissibility is maximum at about 1000 hertz now these are some screenshots the prbm as well as fe analysis has been performed in matlab and uh, the toolbox has been used matlab simscape toolbox has been used for this and both the methods have been used now uh, some uh, discussion points so first is effect of joint thickness now you can see that this if this uh, bigger one is a rigid link and smaller one is a flexible link then the thickness is dimension shown here and length dimension is shown here now it can be seen that when thickness is more up, 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 up here the natural frequency of the isolator is going to increase this is the effect of thickness on this thing now we have compared the vibration isolation performance of the present system to that of the conventional system now here this is very important that the black uh, continuous line is representing the vibration isolation performance of the presented novel method and this uh, dotted line is vibration isolation performance of a typical vibration isolator which is coming in the form of elastomer layer now it can be seen here in down that this is the conventional thing wherein 
the bore cutting tool is there and in between cutting tool and machine tool holder there is a elastomer layer and this elastomer layer is basically used as a vibration isolator in condition in comparison to that we are having fmva here which is using flexible links and elastomer operating in horizontal direction now, now this figure shows that the fmva will offer better damping performance in comparison to the conventional arrangement up to the frequency at this particular point which is close to 730 hertz so up to 730 hertz the force transmissibility of fmva will be much lower than that of the conventional but but beyond 730 the force transmissibility is higher for the proposed solution it is because of the occurrence of the resonance frequency now to overcome this limitation what we are proposing is that we are proposing one additional damping element in vertical direction so what will happen up to 730 hertz this element damping element which is there in a, which is operated in horizontal direction will operate and beyond 730 hertz the damping element which is there in vertical direction will operate and this solution will provide much lesser force transmissibility in comparison to that of the conventional solution the conclusions are the paper is uh, the approach of the paper is to present a vibration isolation application where high stiffness and low static as well as dynamic deflection is desired because presently the methods are not uh, very much available here now uh, it is seen that within up to 730 hertz frequency which covers mostly the dominant frequency range in case of a boring machine up to 53 percent reduction in force transmissibility can be achieved the simulation platform is matlab and both the methods have been validated that is prpm as well as fea and we are going up to 730 or 700 hertz and the natural frequency of the vibration isolator is 1100 hertz it can be noted that if we use a conventional solution for this case then if the natural frequency of the machine is uh, 800 then we have to shift to natural frequency which is much less than 800 which will come to be 200 and if we are keeping 200 hertz natural frequency the stiffness will be coming down and if stiffness is coming down then the deflection of the tool is going to increase but this method is not giving appreciable amount of vertical deflection of the cutting tool and vertical deflection of the cutting tool also here is very less as it has been seen here that an uh, earlier reported vertical deflection is close to 0 0.022 to 0 0.0396 but what we record with this method is very close uh, it is very less than that of the reported values in earlier case so what we what significance it will have here is that when vertical deflection is less the chattering will be negligible and surface finish will be better as well as tool life is better so it can be seen that deflection of the cutting tool is also reducing and force transmissibility is also reducing with this method uh, so here I conclude. Uh, any questions? Thank you very much. Any questions, please? Thank you, ma'am. No questions. So once more, thank you very much for your presentation and have a nice day. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So uh, we will continue now with uh, the next uh, lecture of uh, authors Karol Grzegorz Koniecki, Krzysztof Talaszka, which is entitled Analysis of Wedge Lock Washer Using the Finite Element Method. I would like to ask you for your presentation please thank you good morning ladies and gentlemen uh, today's topic is analysis of wedge log washer using finite element method which we prepared together with uh, the engineer krzysztof Tawaśka. next please at the beginning uh, how the wedge washers are built up the washers have um, wedges on the inside and uh, serrations on the outer side. Uh, the coefficient of friction between the wedges uh, is lower than uh, the coefficient of friction between the serrations and the surface of the contact uh, uh, between uh, the serrations and uh, the surface of the clamped part. Next, please. 
uh, how the wedge lock effect works and what will be tested. Uh, during tightening, the serrations cut into the head of the bolt and uh, into the surface of the clamped part. Uh, during untightening, the top washer's cams will override the cams of the bottom washer, creating an increase in the force in the bolt. And this is because the cam angle alpha is greater than the thread piece of the bolt uh, beta. Serrations will make impressions mark on the uh, head of the bolt and on the contact surface. All the list of aspects will be tested, preload, torque, impressions marks, and in general, the wedge lock effect. So, uh, all the materials have been modeled as um, elastic plastic, um, M20 grade uh, 8.8 .8 hex head bolts were used for the tests. Uh, for the simulation, uh, the same material property were set for the bolt and the clamped part. Uh, two steps uh, were created. Uh, the first step, uh, tightening, and the second step, uh, untightening. Uh, procedure type, dynamic explicit, uh, boundary condition, displacement and rotation uh, correlated to the thread pitch in the second step and in the in the first step and uh, for the second step the same boundary condition but the opposite direction the element size uh, of the ele the element size uh, in general is 0 0.6 millimeters uh, but to ensure the free sliding between uh, wedges the element size on the wedges is uh, 0 0.3 millimeters a partition was created on the bolt and on the clamped part according to the diameter of the washer. Two contact properties were created that differ in friction formation. The coefficient of friction in general is in general contact is 0 0.2 and between the wedges is 0 0.05. And the results. First, the torque time graph. You can see point A where uh, tightening ends and the torque uh, change its direction. The point B where untightening uh, begins. You can see that from uh, point B to C, uh, you can see the increase in the torque. Um, and from C to D, uh, the torque stops uh, increasing. This is uh, um, do the uh, significant deformation in wedges and this in turn uh, but not, uh, not taking into account uh, the true hardening of washers in the material property. Uh, why the, the tightening torque is greater uh, than the untightening torque? This is kind of obvious because uh, during tightening the applied torque must overcome uh, three things. Um, the friction in the thread, the friction between the uh, head of the bolt and the contact surface, and uh, the applied torque must overcome the inclined plane of the thread to obtain a preload. And during untightening, the applied torque must overcome only uh, the friction forces. forces. On the preload time graph, you can see the same dependencies, uh, including the increase in the preload from point B to C. However, uh, it should be noted that um, the preload does not um, increase immediately. You can see some deviation, uh, which I describe later. Okay. And finally, the preload torque uh, graph. The applied torque, um, 460 Nm, allowed to generate uh, preload uh, 100 kN, which is about 75% in relation to yield point. Uh, you can see the extra tension generated by the cams. However, uh, there is some deviation, deviation at the lower limit of minus 5% of the initial tension and the deviation at the upper limit, plus 10% of the initial tension. 
Why the preload does not increase immediately? This is because the, um, at the beginning of untightening for a really short time, the serrations uh, have not had time to cut into the uh, contact surface. And summary, um, uh, the wedge lock effect works fine. The serrations uh, cut into the uh, contact surface. As a result, the rotation um, is uh, ensured only between the wedges. However, like I said before, for a re really short time, uh, the rotation does not place uh, between the wedges because the serrations have not had time to cut into the contact surface. Yes, okay, next. Okay, back, last uh, Yes, uh, you can see here impressions marks on the contact surface. And finally, uh, the conclusion is the, that the solution actually secures the connection against loosening uh, due to the appropriate geometry of washers and not friction. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions, please? No questions? Are there? So, thank you very much. Thank you. Once more. Thank you. <laughs> Let me follow with uh, the next. Next lecture, the last lecture before coffee break. Uh, the lecture is entitled in computer edit eco design, grinding machines using software SolidWorks sustainability. Uh, I hope it will be no <laughs> problems with, uh, <laughs> with the connection now. And I would like to uh, ask uh, Mr. Daniel Lachny for presentation. Do you hear me, Mr. Lachny? Good morning. Nie, nie jest zalogowany. Tak, w tom prípade coffee break <laughs> na nás čaká, takže nech sa páči. Máme teraz prestávku, tým pádom máme dlhšiu prestávku na coffee break. A, lebo pokračujeme o 11. alebo skôr asi ako o 11. nemôžeme. At 11 o'clock. Uh, pretože... No, Ďalší prednášajúci budú pripravení na 11. Lebo je to znova online, online prezentácia. Takže máme... So, see you at 11 here. Have a nice time uh, at coffee break. Takže ešte raz, srdečne vás vítam v tejto sekcii zamerané na matematické modelovanie a simuláciu. A rada by som teda privítala pána Michala Bartoša, pána, ktorý je, je autorom z prezentácie Conceptual Design and Simulation of Cable Driven Parallel Robot for Inspection and Monitoring Tasks. A nech sa páči, poprosím vás o prednesenie vašej prezentácie. Ďakujem za slovo, vážená predsedkynia, vážení prezentujúci, vážení diváci. Moje meno je teda Michal Bartoš a dovolte mi, aby som odprezentoval svoj plánok s názvom, ako spomenula pani Conceptual Design and Simulation of Cable Driven 
that are available for inspection and monitoring task. Takže s rastúcimi požiadavky, požiadavkami na kvalitu výroby sa teda zvyšuje požiadavka na kontrolu samotného výrobného procesu. A vlastne to je dôvod, prečo sa musí výrobný proces kontrolovať. Na začiatok by som povedal, z čoho pozostáva vlastne článok. Článok obsahuje teoretický prehľad použitia paralelných robotov, potom analýzu paralelných robotov a robotov s paralelnou kinematickou štruktúrou, ďalej výber vhodného typu paralelného robota pre aplikáciu pri monitorovaní, prehľad možnosti použitia lanového robota v športe a tiež v priemyselných aplikáciách a vlastne záver alebo už jadro je vlastne zjednodušený konštrukčný návrh lanového robota použitého na vizuálnu kontrolu parametrov. Ďalej. Vlastne aký to je kvalitný produkt? Je to produkt, ktorý je schopný si udržať svoju vlastne kvalitu počas vlastne celej svojej životnosti. A teda výrobný proces sklade vysoké požiadavky na kvalitu a rýchlosť výroby, na ktoré je samotný výrobný proces veľmi citlivý na rôzne faktory. Vlastne pojem kvalita obsahuje dve zložky, ktoré určujú, či je výrobok vhodný na použitie, ako je kvalita návrhu výrobku a kvalita výrobku vo výrobe. Čiže manažment kvality vo výrobe sa preto vzťahuje na jednotlivé časti, napríklad vstupnú kontrolu materiálu, kontrola výrobného procesu, výstupnú kontrolu, metrologickú skúšku a napríklad aj samotnú kontrolu pracovných zariadení a kontrolu výrobného procesu. Vizuálne systémy. Za účelom riadenia výrobného procesu No, účelom riadenia výrobného procesu je minimalizovať riziko vyššie spomenutých faktorov a vylúčiť samotné riziko zastavenia výrobného procesu. Vlastne pri monitorovaní a riadení výrobného procesu je možné pomocou vizuálnej kontroly monitorovať rôzne parametre, ovplyvňujúce prevádzkový proces výroby. Vizuálnu kontrolu je možné použiť buď statické kamery, ktoré sú umiestnené v určitých miestach výrobnej linky, alebo kameru, ktorá sa dokáže pohybovať v priestore nad výrobnou linkou. Pre našu aplikáciu lanového robota sme teraz zvolili kameru pohybujúcu sa v ploche výrobnej linky, a teda robota s právnou kinematickou štruktúrou. Pán Bartoš, prepáčte, nevidíme vašu prezentáciu. Skúste na ňu kliknúť, lebo vidíme len vás a seba. Aha. Vidíme prezentáciu. Už vidíte? Už áno, už áno, v poriadku. Dobre. 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 Dobre, nech sa páči. Takže robot s paralelnou kinematickou štruktúrou. Paralelná kinematická štruktúra je v mechanizmu s uzatvoreným kinematickým reťazcom, ktorý obsahuje vlastne základňu, platformu a minimálne dva nezávislé vodiaké reťazce. Vlastne na obrázku je možné vidieť porovnanie robota so sériovou kinematickou štruktúrou. Teda to je ten prvý obrázok a roboty s paralelnou kinematickou štruktúrou. Čiže plánový robot patrí do medzi paralelnou kinematiku. Je to vlastne typ paralelného robota, pri ktorom sa ako pohon používajú prúžne lana, 
koniec každého lana je navinutý okolo navijaka poháňaného motorom a druhý koniec je vlastne pripojený, môžeme vidieť, k efektoru, čo je v našom prípade kamera a snímacie zariadenia. Na obrázku dole vidíme teda základný koncept a komponenty paralelného robota s osmi vyťažnými lanami, ktoré sú umiestnené v každom rohu. Amotné dĺžky káblov a niekedy aj vlastne polohy tých navijakov sa menia s ovládacím systémom. Vlastne použitie lanového robota. Najväčšou výhodou použitia lanového robota je jeho extrémne nízka hmotnosť a schopnosť práce vo veľkom pracovnom priestore. Vlastne vďaka nízkej hmotnosti toho samotného efektora je robot schopný dosávať až zrýchlenia 40G. Najväčšou nevýhodou sú samotné lana, ktoré vlastne neumožňujú tlak na plošinu a robot ťa vlastne nemôže pohybovať tak, že lano tlačí. Na zabezpečenie konkrétnej polohy v priestore je teda nevyhnutné, že všetky lana môžu byť neustále pod nasetím. Na tomto obrázku môžeme vidieť vlastne pracovný priestor robota, čo je v našom prípade kocka alebo vlastne kváder. Lánové roboty sa už vlastne používajú dlhšiu dobu v športovom priemysle na zachytenie športového vysielania. Na štádionoch kvôli tomu, že môžu pracovať na veľmi veľkej ploche. Na obrázkoch môžeme vidieť vlastne na obrázku 4A systém Skycam a na obrázku 4B systém Spidercam. Pre naše použitie monitorovania výrobnej linky budeme vlastne vychádzať z podobného konceptu. Tu už je samotný koncepčný návrh. Vlastne náš pracovný prístor bude mať tvár kvádru o rozmere 20x5x2 metre. Pracovný prístor bude umiestnený nad výrobnou linkou, z dola ohraničený výrobnými strojmi ktoré sa nachádzajú v linke a zhora samotnou konštrukciou haly. Väčšina výrobných hal používa portálové žeriavy a to je vlastne dôvod, prečo nemôžeme naše navijaky umiestniť do rohov a dôvod, prečo musíme vytvoriť samonočnú konštrukciu, kde budú vlastne v rohoch úplne nespomínané navijaky. Na ďalšom slajde vlastne vidíme navijak už samotný. Vytvorili sme dva návrhy. Prvý návrh je navijak bez vedenia a ďalší návrh bude navijak z vedenia. Pri riešení bez vedenia lana bude použitý bubón s ťažným lanom umiestneným na takéto rotujúcej platforme. Platforma bude umiestnená v rohoch tej samolostnej konštrukcie. Otočná doska je vlastne spojená so základňou na axiálnom ložisku. A vlastne na obrázku môžeme teda vidieť kompletnú zostavu, pozostavujúcu z navíjania lana, čo je vlastne servomotor s prevodovkou a remenica, cez ktorú bude vlastne lano natiahnuť. Na v tomto obrázku je vlastne zobrazené riešenie aj s ukladaním lana na bubón, čo je v podstate bubón, v ktorého strede je umiestnený tiež servomotor a cez rameňový prevod je vlastne poháňaný bubón. Vlastne pri použití 
kamier a rôznych zariadení určených na monitorovanie je potrebné k týmto zariadeniam pripojiť napájací a dátový kabel. Podľa potreby sú zariadenia umiestnené na vlastne koncovom efektore, čo v našom prípade efektor je vlastne doska natiahnutá medzi lanami, na ktorom je umiestnená kamera a ďalšie zariadenia s požadovanými senzormi. Na obrázku teda môžeme vidieť návrh automatického navíjacího zariadenia. Toto je obrázok samotného efektora, na ktorý je možné umiestniť rôzne typy zariadení, ako sme už spomenali, napríklad rôzne skenovacie zariadenia, napríklad snímače kvality vzdušia termokameru, snímače teploty, alebo v podstate to môže byť jednoduchá kamera s online videoprenosom k operátorovi. To je ďalší pohľad na efektor. Pri vlastne našej aplikácii snímania výrobného procesa výrobnej linky sa kamera bude neustále pohybovať ponad výrobnú linku a je dôležité použiť zariadenie, ktoré eliminuje vibrácie a pohyb tej platformy, čiže sme navrhli použitie trojosového gimbalu, ku ktorému bude pripojená priemyselná kamera. Použitie gimbalu taktiež umožňuje otačanie okolo troch osí, takže kameru je v podstate možné polohovať a smerovať na požadovanú pozíciu na tej výrobnej linke. Vytvorili sme aj vlastne napäťovú analýzu. Pre vykonanie analýzy a výpočet osobiacich síl bolo potrebné poznať vlastne hmotnosť toho samotného efektora. Hmotnosť efektora je vlastne súčet hmotnosti platformy, hmotnosti kamery a hmotnosti gimbala. Tiež musíme poznať smery pôsobiacich síl. Vlastne v našej analýze sme použili taký zjednodušený model, keďže smery pôsobiacich síl vždy závisia od polohy toho efektora a plošiny v pracovnom prístore v danom čase. Pre základný výpočet sme teda uvažovali, že efektor je umiestnený v strede tej výrobnej linky a že vlastne všetky štyri lana zvierajú v podstate rovnaký uhol. Na obrázku 12 je teda zobrazená tá zjednodušená situácia, kedy sa efektor nachádza v strede pracovného priestora, kedy je v podstate možné pôsobiacu silu rozdeliť medzi štyri lana. Tu už môžeme vidieť výsledok analýzy pevnostnej, ktorá bola vykonaná pevnostnej analýzy, ktorá bola vykonaná v programe Creo Parametric. Analýza nám ukazuje, že napätie sa zväčša vytvára v spojeniach medzi ťažnými lanami a efektorovou platformou, čo je tu na. A vlastne ukazuje, že to je najnámahavejšie miesto na tej platforme. Samozrejme, smery sa budú meniť s tým, ako sa bude platforma pohybovať po tom pracovnom priestore, keďže sa budú meniť uhly tých zárnych lán. Takže ako sme spomenuli na začiatku prezentácie, s rastúcimi požiadavkami na kvalitu výroby sa zvyšuje požiadavka na kontrolu výrobného procesu. A vlastne to je dôvod, prečo sa musí výrobný proces monitorovať. Vlastne v článku sme teda vytvorili jednoduchý koncepčný návrh takého zariadenia vlastne slúžiaceho na vizuálnu kontrolu výrobnej linky alebo výrobného procesu. Dizajn sa skladá z jednotlivých častí, ktoré v budúcnosti je možné ešte upraviť a budú vlastne použité na spomínaný vizuálny proces.
Ďakujem za pozornosť. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, ďakujem pekne za prezentáciu. Nejaké otázky, any questions, please? No. Ja by som sa opýtala, uh, vy ste to, to návrh ste robili pre nejakú konkrétnu výrobnú linku do nejakého konkrétneho typu uh, technologického procesu výrobného podniku? Ano, my sme mali vlastne požiadavku od jednej firmy, ktorá sa zaoberá výrobou pneumatik, že by chceli Aha. vlastne kontrolovať ten výrobný proces a že chceli by na to použiť uh, vlastne takéhoto lanového robota. Uh -huh. A tam je možné, teda ste hovorili, že tam je možné pripevniť vlastne uh, rôzne typy snímačov, áno? Čiže môže to byť kamera, môže to byť uh, proste uh, infra, áno, kamera, alebo teda termovýzna no, kamera, môže detektory, nejaké... ktoré... Áno, aj nejaké snímače, napríklad znečistenia vzdušia, alebo teploty. Keďže oni robia napríklad s pneumatikami, tak tam dochádza často, a často k vulkanizácii tej gumy napríklad a potrebujú vedieť rôzne hodnoty tých výrobných parametrov a tak. Aha, čiže tam je to možné, ale tam, no, tam vulkanizačný proces ten je spojený s vysokými teplotami, áno, a s únikom pár a tak ďalej, takže tam ano. asi by sa to nedalo nejako do toho vulkanizačného lisu, ale ako už hotový výrobok, hej, určite. A tam mm. sa jedná teda o tú vizuálnu kontrolu, áno? Vizuálnu, no. keď sa jedná o výsledné nejaký výrobok. Tak a tá rýchlosť pohybu tej, toho snímača, tej, tej priemyselnej kamery sa dá vlastne regulovať, áno? Dá sa nastaviť. Mm, áno, dá sa vlastne, klasicky sa vytvorí vládací program a tam už sa dá všetko nastaviť. Aha, jasné. Uh -huh. Čiže aj pohyb, tam sa, pre, tam sa uvažuje, že sa bude pohybovať v nejakom ohraničenom priestore. Áno, tá, tá uh -huh. kamera sa bude pohybovať v tom ohraničenom priestore. Ano, vlastne ten náš návrh obsahuje len 4 motory, ktoré budú umiestnené v tých horných rohoch. Ano. Keďže vlastne zo spodu sme ohraničení tými strojmi. A tak budeme sa vlastne pohybovať len v priestore, ako keby kvázi v dvojdimenzionálnom. Nie v troj, ale iba v dvoj. Áno, jasné. Hej, áno, je to po ploche. A vy ste hovorili, ste spomínali, že ste museli uh, navrhnúť aj nosník, ktorý uh, vlastne bude, na ktorom bude upnuté, upnuté toto zariadenie. Tak ten nosník mm, no. inštalovať tam v tej, uh, v tom, v tej prevádzke? Áno, môžem vrátiť. Mm -hmm, môžete. Hm, tu na vlastne vidno ten návrh. To sú vlastne uh, hliníkové profily. Aha, hliníkové. To sú vlastne ako tými polotovary, ktoré sa len vyskladajú do požadovaného tvaru. A potom už napríklad na samotný roh sa umiestní to naviaci zariadenie. Mm -hmm. Áno, jasné. Hej, až v rámci toho priestoru, ako je ten nosník, tak tak sa môže pohybovať vlastne, áno, tá, tá kamera. Mm -hmm. v, tu na vlastne v to šede, na tom obrázku je vlastne Aha. priestor tej výrobnej linky a Aha, áno. tá vrchná časť je v podstate náš pracovný priestor. Mm -hmm, jasne, čiže tam to, je, to kopíruje veľkosť toho, ten pracovný priestor je taký istý veľký ako tá časť pra, tej, tej výrobnej linky, ktorá má byť monitorovaná. Aha, áno. Hej? Hmm. Uh -huh. Dobre. Veľmi pekne ďakujem ešte raz. Ďakujem aj ja. Za za A želám vám teda príjemný deň na Slovensko. Pozdravujeme. Dovidenia. Hmm, ďakujem. ďakujem. Next. Presentation, next, next lecture is entitled uh, in uh, determination of the operational parameters, values for Airbus A300-600 is ST Belu, Beluga, Beluga aircraft on the basis of CFD tests. Uh, I would like to invite 
Mr. Novatsky. To our uh, can, can, can you can you hear me? Uh, yes, I'm sharing Mr. my Mr. Novatsky. Yes. yes. Hello. Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Marcin Novatsky. I'm very, very I would glad like that to you invite you. Yes. Yes, and I'm uh, just uh, adding, yes, adding new new presentation. So uh, it's converting file, and I think I will be ready in a few seconds. Yes. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Loud okay. So I would like to ask you for your presentation, please. Uh, can you hear, see it? Yes. Okay. Um, somebody is okay. Uh, so, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Marcin Novatsky and uh, the topic of my today's presentation will be determination of the operational parameters values for an uh, Airbus A300-600 ST uh, Beuga aircraft on the basis of uh, computer, uh, computational fluid dynamic tests. Uh, and as the introduction, the article presents the method for estimating the values of the basic operational and aerodynamic parameters of an aircraft. Uh, it contains a multi-stage, as I will uh, describe later, analysis uh, of CFD tests results for the uh, for this aircraft, which is uh, Airbus Beluga uh, A300-600 ST. Um, the aircraft perfection, uh, which is the main parameter considered in this analysis, is a parameter that can help determine the optimal angle of attack for an aircraft and its operating altitude. Um, the components of, an, of the aerodynamic force uh, are the lift and drag force of the aircraft. An aeroplane is an aerodyne, which means that it's heavier, heavier than the air, uh, and the aerodynamic force must be generated in order to start flight. Uh, to generate lift, uh, which is uh, lifting the plane up, the plane must move in relation to the surrounding medium, uh, and the force responsible for giving an airship speed is called the thrust, which uh, which moves uh, the airplane aircraft uh, through the surrounding medium. Uh, the con counter force uh, for the uh, lift force is a drag force. The forces acting on the airplane are shown on, a, on this figure. As we can see, the uh, flight uh, aerodynamic uh, forces uh, as uh, FL, which is a lift force, FD, which is a drag force, uh, FA, which is the main aerodynamic force, FT, which is thrust force, uh, alpha, uh, which we can see is the angle of attack of the, of the airplane, and G is the gravitational force uh, of uh, acting on, on the aircraft. Uh, something bad happened. Uh, maybe I will... Um, share my screen, will be easier. Can you hear, see my screen now? Pardon? Uh, can you see my screen? I just uh, share yes, my screen. I, uh, we, uh, yes, so we can see it, but uh, it's some problem okay, maybe, with, with uh, the text. Wait a, sec wait a second <laughs> here. I'll start to do something. Share screen. I cannot share my screen. Okay, so I will do this like, like this. Uh, okay. The lift force, yes, the, the lift force is generated as a result of the medium flowing around the airfoil of the of the wing of the aircraft and is described using the equation one. Uh, but flow accelerates and the air stream over the profile uh, accelerates and the stream uh, below the profile uh, is slowing down which leads to the formation of a pressure difference between the top and the bottom of the airfoil. The generation of, uh, the, the, the generation of this uh, pressure difference is called the lift force. Uh, and the counter force, as I said, mentioned before, is a drag force which acts on a moving object, object in the opposite di direction of its direction of movement and affects the fuel consumption of the aircraft and its flight properties. 
Uh, this drag force can be described by, by the equation number two, uh, where the CL is the lift force coefficient, FL is the lift force value, uh, CD is the drag force coefficient, rho is the density of the medium, S is the wing surface, SX uh, is the projection surface of the plane perpendicular to the uh, velocity uh, vector. Uh, or the movement of the aircraft, and V is the velocity of the moving object. In this case, is uh, Airbus A300-600 SC Beluga. Uh, here we can see some parameters um, of the used uh, aircraft model, and to determine the characteristics uh, of the aircraft during the CFD test, uh, I have to use some of the operating parameters of the, of the aircraft. Uh, it is a version of the standard A300-600 uh, white body airliner, but it's modified to, the, to carry aircraft parts and oversized cargo. Uh, because of its uh, unusual shape, it is used in this uh, analysis. And some technical data we can see on the, in, the, in the table uh, right here. Uh, the first step in the method uh, determining the operational parameters of the aircraft was to create the three-dimensional model of this uh, Airbus Beluga in real dimensions, which means that the model is straight, uh, straight line uh, as the real plane. Uh, and the subject is to the uh, series of numerical CFD simulation. Uh, the model was made with attention to the characteristics, uh, characteristic geometrics of the airplane with use of the MACA 63215 airfoil. Uh, here we can see some mesh uh, of the computer uh, fluid dynamics uh, simulations and uh, the, determining the optimal angle of attack. And for this purpose, the series of CFD tests were carried out with uh, some uh, conditions like uh, slight altitude with zero meters, which, uh, which corresponds to the parameters we can have on a sea level. Right here, velocity 200 meters per second. Uh, atmospheric pressure with 100, 1,325 Pascal, and the temperature of 2,092 Kelvin, which is uh, to 20 degrees Celsius. And the angles of attack in the range from uh, 8 degrees to uh, 20 degrees in steps of 2 degrees. Uh, the simulations were carried out for various angles of attack, as I mentioned before. Uh, the values of the lift force and the drag force of the, of generated on the aircraft were determined by analyzing the values of the force uh, acting on the axis of the model coordinate system, which we can see here, z-axis, x and y-axis. Um, determining the operational and maximum altitude of the aircraft, and for this uh, purpose, Hello. Mr. Mr. Novatsky, can you hear me? Mr. Novatsky, can you hear me? No? Are you there? Yes, I'm there. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, Mr. Hello? Novatsky. Yes, I can we didn't, hear you. We, can we, hear you now. we didn't didn't hear you. Uh, you can uh, just now. Uh, you uh, we we can hear you. So, so uh, you, can you hear me now? continue, please. Yes. Okay. Uh, and in this case, uh, the changing uh, parameter is the flight altitude, which changes uh, from 9,000 9, 9, uh, meters to eighteen thousand meters. Uh, and the presented method can be used as, as an auxiliary tool in the aircraft design process for determining its characteristics before making a real-time uh, model and maybe test it in the wind tunnel. Uh, okay. And the CFD simulations allowed us to, using the dependencies which I mentioned before, one and two, to determine the lift coefficient, uh, CL, as I said, and the drag coefficient CD into a lift drag ratio K, which we can see uh, is in the second to last column in the table. Uh, 
uh, the optimal angle of attack understood to be the angle at which the airplane generates the highest value of lift force while generating the lowest value of drag force, which uh, is uh, the ratio lift to drag ratio K. And the highest value of the lift to drag ratio K indicates the optimal angle of attack for uh, this airplane, which is 18 degrees, as we can see on the slide. Uh, here we can see the graphs presenting our uh, CL, which is coefficient of lift force, and CD, which is coefficient of uh, drag force, uh, which uh, at angle of 18 degrees is minimum and maximum, and then it increases and decreases rapidly. So we can say that 18 degrees is the optimal angle of attack for this uh, for this airplane, which indicates also by which is indicated also by the uh, K parameter, which is lift to drag uh, ratio. We can see it for the 18 degrees. It uh, has a maximum value a little bit above the seven. Uh, OK, in the next step of the research, the maximum flight altitude of the concert concert considered aircraft was estimated. And the data contained in table three allowed uh, me for the determination of the aerody aerodynamic perfection coefficient, which is K. And it is understood as the, as I said, lift coefficient. The maximum value of this coefficient indicates the airplane has reached its operating flight altitude. Because we can say that uh, it, this value can indicate the optimal angle of attack and also can indicate the optimal flight altitude for this aircraft. Analyzing the determined data, it can be concluded that the operational ceiling for this uh, uh, Airbus A300-600 Beuga is 20, uh, 20, uh, 12,000 meters. As we can see uh, here, because the K value is, uh, is, is the biggest one, uh, which is 6.7. The value of lift coefficient to drag uh, coefficient, okay, as a function of a flight altitude, uh, as a function of flight altitude can be uh, described using a, a function. In this case, it's, uh, I think it's a, it's a function described by the equation on the left, and uh, coefficient of determination of this function is 84%. Uh, here we can see, in order to the determinant of maximum altitude of this uh, aircraft, uh, the lift forces values generated during the flight at a certain altitude should be compared with the maximum takeoff weight of this airplane. And the maximum takeoff weight is 155,000 kilograms, so 155 tons. In order to accurately determine the maximum flight altitude of, uh, of this aircraft, the equation of the function describing the value of the generated lift force and the drag force uh, should be uh, ass assessed. This calculation led to the conclusion that the maximum operations of the uh, operating altitude for the Airbus uh, aircraft uh, considered in this analysis is 1,465 uh, meters. It was calculated using this, uh, this, cal this equations here, but I don't know why it's, it's not, it cannot be seen. It's, you know, one of the, uh, on the top of the, another. But the coefficient of determinations of these both functions is close to 100%, so 97 uh, or 99%. So I think the error of this estimation is close to the 5%. Uh, and the conclusions that the method for the determination of the optimal angle of attack operating flight level uh, is presented in this article. The conducted research allowed uh, us to determine uh, the optimal angle of attack for the aircraft at the level of 18 percent, uh, 18 degrees, sorry. The second part of the research included numerical analysis of the aircraft flow and uh, allow us to uh, describe it by dependence of the lift force and the drag force. Knowing the function equation of these dependencies allowed us to uh, assess the maximum flight altitude of our uh, our Airbus uh, Beuga, and it was uh, uh, and it was calculated for 14,665 uh, 14, meters. The highest uh, value of uh, aerodynamic perfection values was was recorded for a flight altitude of 12,000 uh, 12, meters, which means that it is the optimal operating. Uh, uh, optimal operating altitude for uh, this aircraft. And this is the last conclusion, which uh, I think fulfilled the topic of the 
of the presentation. So thank you for attention and I'm uh, waiting for uh, the questions. Thank you very much. Any questions, please? So, Mr. Nowatsky, uh, there are no questions, and uh, so I uh, wish you a nice afternoon. Thank you very uh, much. Have a nice day. Thank you very much for Thank your you nice much. presentation, and uh, I wish you uh, all the best. You too. Bye. Th thank you very much, and wish all the best for all the uh, all the people that there are came uh, came to the to the conference. Wish you good luck. Thank, thank you, you thank you very much. So, next presentation is entitled "In Development of a Computational Model of uh, Lattice Structure." Ja bi sam rada privitala pana. Karla Ráža, from Czech Republic, tak sa rozumieme. Takže ja vás poprosím o prednesenie prezentácie, o predstavenie vašich výsledkov výskumu. Nech sa páči, som rada, že ste tu, alebo by som sa tu sama bála. Nech sa páči. OK, thank you very much. As was already said, my name is Karel Ráš and I would like to introduce you our research on the topic of development of a computational model of lattice structure, which I have performed with my colleagues Denis Chval and Mr. Santos. Uh, I am from the University from West Bohemia in Pilsen, Czech Republic, especially from the Regional Technological Institute, from the laboratory for the virtual prototyping and some virtual simulations finance element method. Uh, we are right now dealing with uh, lattice structures. I would like to show you some examples which we have uh, produced. We are dealing with metal, uh, lattice and also plastic ones. All of these structures are produced by the additive manufacturing, needs 3D printing. And during the, during the production, we found some problems. Actually, one of the problems is connected with the, with the production method because the additive manufacturing itself, it's not uh, producing the isotropic materials. They are definitely diff different mechanical properties in lateral uh, and the vertical directions. If we are considering the simple uh, uh, additive uh, manufacturing printer, mm -hmm. which is, for example, the Prusa printer, then the difference in the directions around 40%. So therefore, there is a problem to define mechanical properties for this reason. And another reason is uh, is if you can see these uh, geometries, uh, it's really hard to define what, for example, the young modules of this structure, if you are considering it like a, like a solid material. And uh, we try to somehow simplify the designing process uh, with these structures. My advantage of these lattice structures is a good ratio between the, between the weight and the stiffness. For example, right now we are cooperating with one car producer, which is trying to put these structures inside the sheet metals on the side uh, doors of the car. Yes. And therefore, the uh, crash resistance for the side impact will be much more uh, significant, will be much more stiffer comparing the regular one. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, for example, the Volvo was using some honeycombs, plastic honeycombs inside the doors, and therefore the Volvos are co considering as almost the safest mm -hmm. car in the world. So here are some examples of the lattice structures which we are dealing with. And uh, as I said, we are from the uh, uh, simulation, a virtual simulation group, and there is a problem. For example, we, are, we want to create a part. Uh, we want to describe the stiffness of the part. We want to simulate 
it with finite element method, but definitely we don't have time to model all these structures uh, in this geometry. So therefore, we need somehow to simplify the geometries, but with uh, correct mechanical properties. So can we next? Okay. So I, we choose these three really simple uh, lattice cells, and our research will focus on uh, determination of young modulus of uh, these cells with respect to uh, weight ratio. For example, for the primitive one, is we can imagine the lattice cells like a brick, and the brick is somehow connected. For example, the primitive one is the certain, um, middle points of each face of the brick is connected by the by the rod. The octa is all the middles of the faces are connected with the uh, near faces, but not for the opposite one. And the spherical, it's a brick where inside is removed the spray. It's uh, really easy to print them out by the printer because there are no need to, of supports, but it's hard to realize what, for example, the young models, what's the stiffness of the, of the, of the structure. Uh, so we try to uh, simulate this simple brick, uh, it's 30 times 30 times 30 millimeters uh, in uh, finite elements. We did the as finest mesh as possible because it's a symmetrical, we did just one quarter. And from these uh, simulations, we did, uh, we get some uh, uh, young modulus for individual, individual configurations of the of the lattice uh, structures. Here you can see some results. There are different cell size. It means for the 30 millimeters, we put there three or four or five individual lattice cells on one edge. The diameter of the rod was also changing during the uh, during each uh, specimen. The weight ratio was changing from almost 4% uh, percent to almost 30%. Percent. And the young modulus there is also changed from 25 megapascals to 200. It re really depends on the on the weight ratio. Sometimes it's considered that the young modulus of the lattice structure is young modulus of the regular full solid material times weight ratio, but it's not so accurate. As we can go on the next, not else. Uh, here you can see the graph and the blue points are the individual specimens with respect to the weight ratio. All the specimens had uh, different cell size, different uh, diameter of the rod. And we uh, try to uh, investigate what's, what's the polynomial fun function of all these, all these points. Therefore, we get a function which is unfortunately not able to read, but it's under the under the example of the specimen is young modulus is equal to uh, young modulus of a solid material times some constant uh, times uh, uh, weight ratio squared plus and some another equations. Therefore, we uh, found a formula which gave us the uh, description of young modulus with uh, Error lower than five percent comparing to the uh, comparing to the individual uh, uh, lattice structures, and the same we have done for the the others. Uh, for example, for the octa was a little bit more complicated because we had to divide the the weight ratio in two intervals. There are different equations for young modules until 28% of the weight ratio and from 28 till almost solid material, but solid material is of, co of course nonsense. Uh, there is another equation. So we have done this for all the remaining uh, lattice structures. And as an example, I showed the three lattice structures before where, let's say, isotropic. In X, Y and Z direction, they had the same mechanical properties. Uh, I've shown an orthotrophic lattice structure. 
which have uh, the same mechanical properties in X and Y, but in the vertical direction, there is another uh, Young modulus. Therefore, we perform the same, but there is different Young modulus for uh, lateral direction and for the vertical. Therefore, in virtual simulation for this lattice structure, it can be simplified into the solid material with considering this uh, Young modulus, but the material model has to be orthotrophical. Orthotrophic materials. Okay. And here is the reason why we did this research. Uh, we had an application for one partner. It was this, let's say, boomerang uh, shaped part where inside there, was lot, there were a lot of structures. And we tried to figure out how to simulate it much more faster with respect to the mechanical properties of the lattice inside. And here you can see results for both of the of the um, simulations. The left one is the one with lattice. The right one is the simplified, and the lattice structure is uh, replaced by solid material, but with the Young modulus uh, calculated by the formula uh, which we get before, and uh, uh, the difference, the error is I think less than. 5% between these two, uh, these two approaches. And I think the uh, error is also caused by the not so uh, good mesh on the, on the lattice structure because there is everything curved and the quality of the elements there is not so good. Okay. And here's uh, the summary of that, of that uh, sample. Uh, we when we simulate the regular power with the regular lattice structure, the simulation time was around one hour, 30 minutes. Uh, with the simplification, uh, we get the same results with simulation time less than seven minutes with almost the 95% of the accuracy. So this is the approach we would like to use during the designing parts for, from uh, lattice structures. Uh, okay, and just a few words, we uh, try to validate this approach also uh, with real testing. So these parts were considering from plastic material, PA6. Uh, we have uh, this printer, it's quite new at our laboratory. It's uh, HP Multijet Fusion. It's, uh, as you know, HP is a company which is producing regular printers which were printing on the paper. They changed this uh, technology, but the uh, basic of this 2D printing is used also in this printer. And we were uh, printing these uh, lattice structures on this uh, printer. Here you can see how the specimens from uh, the printer where it looked like uh, before testing and after testing. And during the testing, we tried to get the young modulus and hopefully we were thinking that the results will be the same. Unfortunately, there was a difference between the testing and the simulations around 20%. So we tested also the solid material and we found that the Young modulus written on the data sheet of the material is not the one we get from the real testing. So right now we are focusing more on the determining of the material properties of the of the material because uh, the HP company is providing some material properties, but they are uh, from their tests with specified parameters, specified humidity, and we didn't get these results. So we are the same specimen, but we are around 20% lower comparing their data sheets. So right now we are trying to improve the printing process to get at the, that result. Uh, here is just an example how the stress strain curve looked like uh, during the testing. It's from for the for the primitive lattice structure and 22% of weight ratio. As you can see, the strength is lower than for megapascals is and uh, the solid material has I think around 40 is 10% of the 
uh, strength of the solid material. So the conclusion, uh, we tried to somehow define the process of uh, simulating the lattice structure without real simulations of the lattice structure to get much more faster results because as I said, we are working with some car companies and they don't have time to wait a couple of days for the results. Uh, we found some problem in uh, difference between data sheet of the material and our, our printer. So therefore we are right now focusing on this problem. And for further studies, we would like to focus on more complex, for more complex uh, lattice structures. And we would like to define the mechanical properties of these structures. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much for watching me. Thank you very much for your presentation. Môžem sa opýtať, áno, lebo je naozaj, to je to zaujímavé. Chcem sa spýtať, že či ste tieto výsledky posunuli niekde do praxe v výrobcovi, ako nejaké také zhrnutia a odporúčenia. Myslíte výrobcovi tie tiskáren, nebo obecne? Áno, akože či tie výsledky vlastne pôjdu, lebo vy ste hovorili teda, že ste využili pre aké typy materiálov poliamid. Áno, to je ako tá výplň v podstate do tých aut, automobilov, áno. Je tam niečo, čo by bolo ako posunúť ako výsledok toho vášho skúmania do praxe? V podstate situácia je taková, že za náma prídejcky nejaký výrob sa řekne nám, chceme tady nieco vyplniť, chceme navrhnúť nejaký výrob. Takže priamo to bolo na objednávku vlastne. Ale jak si to napočítáte, to už je vaše vec. A to je v podstatě moc nezajímá, ale my jsme zjistili, že počítat to jako standardně vysítila to, to samozřejmě nemá smysl a je to špatně. Takže jsme se snažili najít nějaký zjednodušující přístupy, jak se dostat k nějakým rozumným hodnotám. Ano, ano. Jinak ty naše zákazníky zajímá jenom v podstatě výsledek, předat jim ten díl. Určitě, ano, ano, samozřejmě. A vy přímo vlastně aj Čiže spolupracujete s výrobcami priamo tých dielov, čo sú v podstate tie polimérne výplne a tie komponenty, ktoré ste... Tam ten komponent, ktorý tam bol v takomto poloblúku, ako ten bumerang, tak to je konkrétne nejaký komponent? To je konkrétne zrovnané do auta, ale to je na studentskou formuli. Nejaký nieco tam držalo, to si vás nechali vytisnúť. Kolegové, co to mají na starosti. Áno, áno. Lebo je to zaujímavé, ak ste spomínali, že aj kov, áno, aj že z kovu v podstate, a máte 3D tlačiarne? Máme od ELSu na momentálne tá tiskná inkonel hlavne, alebo nástrojovou ocel. Aha. Ale taky, taky. Ale my to radšej popravde deláme na tej plastovej, ktorý to je výrazne levnejší. Určite. Určite tá prevádzka, hej, je že lacnejšia a Dá sa to v podstate na model a tie vstupné parametre získate. Tam tie vzorky, ktoré ste mali na záver, čiže vy ste aj reálne testovali, zaťažovali ste ich a reálne ste merali vlastne ten Yangov modul, áno, a ste to dávali ako vstupné parametre a porovnávali ste to s tými modelovými situáciami. Dobre. Veľmi pekne vám ďakujem ešte raz. Takže... Zatlieskám sama, ale bola to vynikajúca prezentácia. No a budeme pokračovať. We will continue with last but not least lecture. And I would like to invite ak budem môcť teda, ak už budeme pripojení, uvidíme, či sa pripojila. Nepripojila sa? Ani Artem Artiukov sa nepripojil? Nepripojil. No, takže ja veľmi pekne ďakujem. Pre mňa to bol príjemný, príjemný čas strávený tu. Veľmi zaujímavý. Takže ja ďakujem za účasť vám, teda konkrétne kolegovi, ktorý najvernejší, áno, zostal do poslednej chvíle. 
No a želám príjemný zvyšok dňa. Veľmi pekne ďakujem za technickú podporu for technical support to our colleague. Takže ďakujem pekne a ja, idem sa tešiť na ďalšiu príjemnú konferenciu. Zaželám. Ja ďakujem, že sa ešte uvidíme. Čas vám, teda konkrétne kolegovi, ktorý, ktorý je najvernejší, ale zostávam do, posl- do poslednej chvíle. No Dear colleagues, I, I hear me. Veľmi pekne ďakujem za technickú podporu for technical support to our colleague. Takže ďakujem pekne a 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 Dear colleagues, I am here. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, uh, I would like to invite So, Arten, uh, can you hear us? Can, can, uh, can you hear me, Arten? Are you there? Musíme počkať. Musíme zase napojiť. Hello. Uh, can you can you hear me? I would like to invite, okay, invite I, you I hope, to our uh, our session. You hear me? Yes. I'm yes. To share my oh, regards, presentation. Uh, I think uh, there is some problems with sound because between uh youtube translation and uh, our webinar there is a delay uh yes. uh 20 seconds i think so and i am trying to share my presentation jack alex yes. uh, good day i think uh, there is some problems with sound because between uh youtube tra- Oh, nice to hear you again, Artem. Okay, let's start. I would like to present my okay. uh, speech directed to dice bed and drying machines, main stage of optimization calculation. Uh, this is a common work. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, excuse me, excuse me, Artem. We, team we, of two universities, yes, now we, University we of Ukraine and presentation. Alexander Dubček yes. University of Trenčín from uh, Slovak uh, uh, Republic. And uh, first of all, uh, what I want to say, my uh, presentation stress with uh, investigation of new types of dryers, convective dryers, multi-stage convective dryers with uh, different uh, types of perforated shell. And uh, first of all, uh, this is a some example of using of our active hydrodynamic regime 
And first of all, I want to say that uh, active hydrodynamic regime, uh, which is used in such uh, dryers, contributes to the intensification of process without reducing its cost efficiency. And it was the following advantages. You can see some uh, advantages on this slide. First is hydro hydrodynamic sustainability of the process. The next is an increase of the related velocity of the interacting phase motion, a developed surface of the contacted phase interaction, the approximation of a hydrodynamic model of flows in the device to an ideal displacement model and reduce the energy consumption of the process and the lower specific amount of metal in such devices. Next one, how to reduce the energy cost during the drying in multi-stage devices. Uh, the literature analysis of uh, our uh, scientific team presents the following measures uh, on how to reduce the energy cost for the dispersed material drying. Uh, the first one is to reuse heat and waste drying agent. The next to improve the construction of the dryers. The next is improve the dryer layout and its efficiency of the use. And uh, for example, for multi-stage dryers, the drying efficiency of each stage. Uh, there are two, three or four stage in multi-stage, such multi-stage devices, and we need to improve the dry light in uh, each stage for increasing of energy efficiency on each stage. Uh, the next is an introduction of the improved technology of recycle dryer, a differential thermal regime, to reverse and recirculate the drying agent, including the waste one. Okay, uh, some description of uh, theoretical uh, basis. Uh, on the left side of the slide, uh, you can see the calculation scheme, a uh, fragment of the calculation scheme for the multi-stage drying. Uh, and uh, at the right part, you can see some equations of our theoretical model. The first one is the difference between the initial mode of dispersed material and the initial mode of drying agent. The next one is the removal of moisture on the stage of dispersed material. And uh, equation number three is uh, effectiveness of the moisture removal on the uh, stage number I and effectiveness of this stage. We have the difference between initial moisture on the stage and maximum of differences between moistures on the stage. You can see on the left part of the slide uh, some abbreviations of the moisture of drying agent and dispersed material and uh, some abbreviations of if the energy efficiency uh, of each stage. Okay, next one. Uh, on the slide number four, you can see the equation, uh, equation number four, uh, which, de uh, which describes the energy efficiency on the each stage. And uh, the calculation scheme uh, shows that the maximum difference of moisture contents on the stage complies with the difference of the initial moisture of the dispersed material and the initial moisture of the drying agent. And uh, to determine the maximum efficiency of the process on each stage of our gravitational shelf dryer, the test installation ensured the condition under which uh, the drying was performed until no change in the moisture content of the dispersed material has occurred. The calculation results of the maximum difference in the moisture contents of the material corresponding to the maximum efficiency on each stage are represented in this table uh, in this slide, in the bottom part of uh, this slide. This is the stage numbers of our gravitational shelf dryer and the maximum difference in the moisture contents uh, on each stage. Okay, the next. Uh, 
Uh, what I want to say for the visualization of our results, we create uh, OSA software. Uh, the title of software is multi stage fluidizer, and you can see uh, this software interface of this software on this slide. Uh, we need to put in initial data for our calculation, and after this, uh, multi stage fluidizer uh, calculates uh some perimeters parameters of drying unit and gravitational shelf shelf driver function and you can see the main page of this multi-stage fluidizer software and uh what i want to say uh we need to go to some results and the next part of uh, uh visualization visualization of results this is an influence of dry engine uh, recirculation methods on the change of moisture content of dispersed material. This is a left picture, left graph, and the right graph is an influence of the dry engine recirculation method on the change of dry agent moisture content. We need to investigate both streams because uh, we need to solve uh, the equations which is correspond both to the drying agent and the dispersed material. Uh, the organization of the drying agent modern, uh, motion uh, may have a considerable influence on the quality indicators of the dried material and the properties of the drying agent. Uh, this has evolved several studies, the results of which uh, now are presented on the this and the next graphs. The analysis allows us to select the method of the organization of dry and agent motion, which consumes the least energy and ensures the necessary complete removal of moisture from the dispersed material. Okay, and uh, the last graph, an influence of dry and agent recirculation method on the dry and efficiency. As I said before, we have some theoretical model uh, which describes uh, difference and uh, between moisture of uh, flows. And on this graph, you can see uh, the difference between energy efficiency on each stage. And we have a different condition for the calculation of this energy efficiency. And what I want to say uh, on my last slide and at the end of the presentation, uh, the analysis of the computer simulation results proves that the amount of drying agent, which is repeatedly used as a circulation flow, has a considerable influence on the moisture of the dried dispersed material. And the quality of the final product is also predetermined by the initial characteristics of the drying agent. Uh, such as temperature of drying agent and uh, moisture of this drying agent. Uh, the selection of an optimal technological mode of the dryer with inner space section and is a multi-factor task. And solution of uh, this task considers the peculiarities of technological process, a constructive design and uh, energy costs on heating and transferring of the uh, drying agent in the porous medium, in the medium of material, uh, drying material, dispersed material. Uh, this is this may be uh, nitrogen fertilizers. Uh, this may be uh, porous ammonium nitrate. This may be uh, different types of uh, food seeds, etc., etc., etc. And uh, at the end of my presentation. I want to say many thanks for invitation of our team to take part in this conference. And I want to say that it's very important for us, it's honor for us, and we want to wish you success of uh, this conference, success of some scientific investigations and success in all your life. Thank you very much. And Good luck. Well, th thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Artem, for your uh, nice presentation and uh, for your wishes too. Uh, any questions, please? There are no no questions. So, uh, one more time, uh, I like uh, to wish you uh, uh, all the best. Have a nice day and thank you very much for your nice presentation one more time. Thank you. Goodbye. And I hope to uh, see, you, uh, see you soon at, uh, at uh, our faculty in Pucho. Yes? Už ma nepočul. <laughs> Dobre, nevadí. <laughs> Ani na Features of obtaining of porous ammonium nitrate tomorrow in the evening. Have a nice day and best wishes from Ukraine. Thanks. Thank you. Best wishes too. Goodbye.